And we are automatically recording Liza as well. So I can see that people are joining us and we'll just wait a couple more minutes. Lots of people coming in, which is wonderful. Gosh, lots and lots. Somebody has a question already, I think. Yes, well, for the people who are raising their hands, we're not actually able to see your faces. So if you wouldn't mind, there's um, a Q&A section at the bottom of your screen. If, you want, if you've got any questions or you're unsure of anything, if you just pop that question into there, I will be able to just type the response on there before we officially start in a, in a minute or so. But I will explain more once we start officially at 10.30, which is coming up any minute as more people are joining us, which is lovely. <laughs> lovely. Excellent. Right. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Very lovely to see you on this beautiful sunny morning. We're delighted to welcome you to this month's uh, webinar with the very wonderful Liza Lomax. We'll be presenting uh, an hour session around compassion fatigue, which I know is such an important topic for us all. Um, just a, a little bit of sort of housekeeping bits. With regard to any questions that you may have, Liza unfortunately is unable, because of the large number of you joining us this morning, Liza isn't actually able to see you, so can't, won't be able to answer questions directly to you. But if you look along your toolbar, you'll see there's a little section that says Q and A. If you have any questions or would like, you know, you have any scenarios or anything you'd like a little bit of guidance on, we're not able to give a, a sort of a, a large amount of information, but what we'll do is if you write your questions in there, just towards the end of the session, I will monitor that. And uh, I will read your questions out to Liza because she, she's she got so much to tell you. She's not going to have an awful lot of time to answer questions as we roll along. So I will read out your questions at the end. So anything you're not sure of or anything you want some information on, please just put pop that into the Q&A box and I will monitor that. But I'm now going to hand over to Liza because I know she has so much to get through. So I hope you have a wonderful session. All. Thank you very much, Sarah. Okay, I'm going to share my screen with you. So hopefully... Um, you will now be able, no, you will now be able to see my screen. Is that okay? Can you all see my screen? Yes, that's wonderful. We can see that, Liza. Brilliant. Okay. Wonderful. Um, welcome. Uh, we've chosen to do compassion fatigue training at this particular point because at the end of last term, you may have noticed that some of your children's teachers were not as empathic as they as they often are because actually... If you have compassion fatigue happening in schools, it's nearly always at the end of the autumn term, the longest term. Um, and, and teachers have been doing nativity plays and end of term events. And that, that um, whether you call it secondary trauma, compassion fatigue, um, blocked care, um, they're all very similar. Um, and professionals who are engaging with children are going to experience that at the end of, of that stressful engagement with the child. Um, those of you who are foster parents, you may well have experienced the beginnings of um, uh, secondary trauma, compassion fatigue over the Christmas holidays because um, your children would have been so excited and so full on. And they're back at school now. And, ah, yes, you have time to, to relax and, and begin to think about what's actually happened over the last couple of weeks. And this is why this training today is so relevant and so important. Um, so I'm going to start without any more ado. Um, so what is compassion fatigue? Um, it, it's something that happens as a result of caring, really caring for children or young people um, who have been through 
any sort of traumatic experience. It may be developmental trauma the child has suffered. It may have happened a long time ago. But actually, that stress, that trauma, it has not been addressed in the child. They haven't been through a therapeutic process and they are, they're still struggling. Um, and at the point when you are caring for the child, and it only happens with the most empathic and attuned people. So if you do have that sense of, oh, I just, you know, I'm absolutely spent. I have no more love left for this child. If you've been in that place, it's partly because you're so empathic. It's partly because actually you are that emotional, emotionally literate human being who can actually put yourself in the shoes of the child, connect with the child. And at that point, the child, oh, thank goodness, you understand me. And they project their trauma into you and you end up carrying their trauma. Um, and that is what often causes that compassion fatigue. Um, so, um, as I say, you often have secondary trauma and, and blocked care being used synonymously um, with compassion fatigue. Compassion fatigue started as, as a term in the States, um, where secondary trauma um, was, was um, a Freudian term. OK. Um, and how does that feel? You know, with compassion fatigue, it's as if you have you've got no warmth left for this this child, this young person. They have they have sucked you dry. They have taken everything you've given and trampled on it or thrown it back at you, rubbished it, rubbished you. Um, and actually, you're spent, you're done. It's that sort of feeling. Um, and if you opt for that blocked care term, um, it's that you've lost confidence. You know, there's a block there, there's a barrier there. You simply cannot any further connect with this child and give them what you know they need. Um, and you just think, am I any, I'm a lousy foster carer. I can't do this stuff. You know, I've got nothing left to give. Um, so perhaps, perhaps, perhaps I just don't care. Um, and then with the secondary traumatic stress, um, that is in psychological terms, it is the projection of the child's primary trauma into you. And it is as if you are suffering that primary trauma. So you're waking up at three o'clock in the morning and thinking, why am I waking up at three o'clock in the morning? Oh, it's Joe Bloggs, you know. Um, and you have nightmares, but they're usually nightmares about being chased. And it's not your material. It's not your trauma material. It's the child's. The child has projected their trauma into you and you end up carrying it. And you feel hopeless and helpless and sometimes angry. Does that sound familiar? Because actually the child feels hopeless and helpless and often angry, you know? So that is the impact. You are actually mirroring what's going on for that child. And compassion fatigue is a bit, is a bit like that too. Okay. Um, as Sarah said, if you have questions, if, if this is resonating and you're thinking, oh, I need to ask her about that, do put it in the chat box, do put it in the Q&A that she mentioned, um, and we will be stopping 10 minutes ahead of time, five minutes ahead of time, however many questions there are, and I will try and answer them for you. Um, my background, can I just say, was in foster parenting, so um, we fostered for 28 years. Our eldest foster son is, gosh, 53 now, so we're very old. Um, but that um, that experience put me in touch with the difficulties of compassion fatigue, the difficulties of secondary trauma, um, because you do feel as if you have lost that lovely um, energy and, and capacity for care that you had when you first started. Um, so that's what it looks like. OK. Um, the therapeutic model is what we're going to be talking about today because if you understand where compassion fatigue comes from if you understand that you can then begin to heal yourself you can then begin to work with it most importantly you can accept yourself you know one of the things that happens if you go through that process of compassion fatigue is that you think you're failing um, and what we need to do is to try and nudge you towards that place where you say, I'm having a rough time. You know, we're going through the doldrums at the moment with this child. 
um, and I'm suffering with compassion fatigue, but we're on the journey. So it's a therapeutic model. It says we have to care for you. We have to um, help you to understand what's going on. You know, the French have a saying, don't they? Tu comprendre, c'est tu pardonner. If you understand everything, you will forgive everything. You need to understand what's going on for you. And then you can forgive yourself and you can forgive the child. And that's so vital for that child's ongoing journey towards recovery. Um, so you as therapeutic professionals, as foster parents, adopters, social workers, um, you actually offer yourself to the child as a content. You say, I'm here for you. Let me know if I can help you. Let me know if there's anything you want to talk about. You know, your adolescent who says they come in at 10 o'clock and they sit down at the kitchen table and, and they want to stay talking for a while, you know. And your message to them is, yes, I'll, I'll postpone my bedtime. I'll sit down here and I'll, I'll listen. Um, that listening is actually absorbing what that child is, is sharing with you. Um, and your social worker, if you're a foster parent, if, if you're an adopter, um, if you're a teacher, you know, your line manager, whether it's your social worker, whether it's your, your head of department or whatever, they're doing the same thing. They are offering you containment. So at the end of the day, we have both foster parents and social workers um, suffering with compassion fatigue. It's, it's interesting. You don't have people who are um, working, for example, as carers in a, in a nursing home for the elderly. You, they, they don't suffer compassion fatigue because actually they're not accepting the projections of the, of the client, of the patient. It's only where you're engaging with children and, and they, they trigger that, that maternalism, that paternalism. They, they trigger that, um, that caring response, that compassionate caring response. Um, it's not with adults. OK. Um, OK. Um, so what ends up happening, therefore, is the child comes into your home you welcome them, you find ways of making them feel at home with your family. Um, and then they begin to replay their trauma DVD. You may have a honeymoon period of a couple of weeks and sometimes it goes on for a couple of months. But at some point, if they have suffered early trauma, they will replay that trauma DVD. They do it in school. So you have unmanageable behaviors in school. They do it at home. So you have trashing and smashing or shutting down at home. And both in school and at home, you have adults who are trying to manage that, trying to understand, trying to, to process and give back to the child an understanding of why they're doing what they're doing. They're not naughty. They're not bad. What they're um, doing is replaying earlier trauma. So that child, when they were little, they couldn't control so with their birth parents, they were usually too young to control. They might try, but it was usually a, an impossible task. Coming into your environment, they will try and control you because that will help them to feel safe. So, you know, anything you ask them to do, no, not doing that. Um, and they will try and split you and your partner. They'll try and split you and your birth children, for goodness sake, you know. Um, they will come and, and tell tales of, you know, your son, your daughter said this about you or did this bad thing um, because they need to they need to have you all to themselves. Think small baby and, and, and mum, that small baby needs mum all to themselves. That 15 year old foster son that you have just taken in needs to have you all to himself. Um, so that is actually quite tough, quite difficult. And the child is in despair a lot of the time, is saying, how am I going to manage this? Um, and they're, they're enraged with these birth parents who couldn't meet their needs. Um, and you are the next best thing. You're the next in line. You're the parent substitute. So you will get it. You will get all of the rage, all of the despair being targeted at you. And it, forgive me, but it's, it's usually the women, the mothers who get it, because usually it's, it's a mother who didn't protect that child. They may not have been the abuser, but when the abuser did come along, whether it was dad, granddad, you know, an outside the next door neighbor that they left you with, knowing perfectly well that that 
that the, the next door neighbour was not a suitable person to leave their child with. You know, they have not cared enough to protect the child. That is the child's perception. And so you are the parent substitute. You're going to get it. You're going to get all of that rage and you end up feeling exhausted. Um, you're also going to perhaps end up feeling guilty and frustrated because you can't you can't meet your child's needs. You're failing them, um, and and you're you're angry because actually you came into this profession, you came into fostering, you came into social work wanting to make that difference. You came into to teaching wanting to make that difference, and instead of making that difference, it seems that all you're doing is dragging yourselves and your birth family um, into, into the mud at the bottom of a pit of despair um, and not meeting the needs of the child. Um, so you end up saying sometimes, um, it's the child's problem. You know, you need to move this child. I've taken as much as I can take. They have been abusive. They have been unmanageable. They have been um, outrageous in one way or the other. We're not the right placement for them. We're not the right family for them. Um, we're not the right school for them, you know. So you have the adults trying to disengage, saying, we really can't do this. Um, and if we don't catch people at that point, then actually you are going to have yet further trauma visited upon this child because they're going to be rejected again. They're going to be abandoned again. History is going to repeat itself. The DVD is going to replay. And that that child is going to feel that they are um, totally beyond anybody's capacity to, um, to heal, to survive. Um, so you end up with compassion fatigue and the child ends up with despair. Um, so if we can understand why this is an occupational hazard for foster parents and social workers and teachers and adopters and what have you, um, then you will be more resilient. You will actually say, I had, I had this training um, and I understand exactly what's going on for me. I understand what's going on for my partner as well. And so therefore I know what to do. We can manage this. And your resilience, your capacity to have that sort of elasticity of spirit that can twang back into place means that your child is also going to catch that. They're going to catch it from you. And that's wonderful. So this is a really important um, piece of training for you today. Um, so we take it for granted that the child who's coming into you, whether it's your, your home, your classroom, your, your therapy room, whatever, they're going to be have suffered trauma. And they're also likely to be attachment disordered. In other words, they don't have a secure attachment. They don't think that human beings are naturally kind, good people. Um, they avoid human beings. They have an avoidant attachment pattern. They have an ambivalent attachment pattern, which says, well, actually, um, sometimes you're okay, but most of the time you're rubbish. Um, and so therefore, you know, um, I'm, I don't want to engage with you. Um, so the child is going to be struggling with traumatic stress. Um, and the automatic response to trauma, whether it's caused by maltreatment or neglect, involves lots of cortisol, lots of toxic hormones, um, which affects all major body systems and your brain function and your social functioning. So you end up with a biopsychosocial injury. That's massive. It means, you know, I'm going to get sick when other people don't get sick. I'm going to have pains in my legs, in my, you know, in my headaches, tummy aches, and, and people are going to say I'm a hypochondriac, but actually no, it's the stress of what I've been through. Um, my brain function, I'm going to be thinking with a different brain. Everybody else in my class, when the teacher says, come come and sit down, we're going to have circle time now, everybody else does that apart from me. When the teacher says, come and sit down, um, I start running. I start moving even faster because I don't trust adults because my brain function has learned 
that actually adults are dangerous. Um, and social functioning, I'm in survival mode. Um, so any life belt that's around, I'm gonna grab it. I'm not gonna share it. I'm not gonna say, would you like to would you like to go on my life belt? Would you like to hang on to my life belt? I'm gonna say it's all mine. Um and my lunch is all mine. And I'll try and get some of your lunch as well if I can. So I'm not gonna share. Um, I can take, but I can't give. And I can't do empathy. I can't imagine what it's like to be like you. So when people say, how would you feel if somebody did that to you? I'm a person who cannot understand the question. But I've had it asked of me so many times that therefore I will, I will conjure up an answer. You know, this was all of our foster children, bar none. You know, they couldn't do empathy. They couldn't imagine what it was like to be somebody else. But if they were asked, how would you feel if, then they'd say, oh, yeah, okay, I feel dreadful, you know, or whatever, whatever was appropriate. More often than not, it was, I couldn't care less. Um, so that emotional trauma that the child has been through in their birth family means that they can't regulate stress. That they simply haven't got the capacity to, they didn't have a model in their mum. Mum didn't help them to regulate stress. Um, she didn't hold them and stroke them and cuddle them. So the child remains aware of the stress and they're hyper aroused. So you have your children who are kicking off, trashing, smashing, blowing the house down. Or you have the child who's shut down and they're dissociated. Um, they have no longer any wish to engage. They've lost sensory awareness. Uh, and that's a protective reaction again. Um, but it means that both the child who is hyper aroused and the child who is disassociated, they will still suffer, but not necessarily be aware of it. Um, so what the child needs is safety, is capacity to engage with others, um, which means good parental figures, good teachers, people who are constantly emotionally and physically available to them, um, and the ability to talk about it. And you sort of take it for granted that if the child wants to talk about it, they'll be able to. But actually, for this group of children, these traumatised children, they can't talk about it. And when I go on to talk about compassion fatigue, one of the... One of the um, characteristic features of compassion fatigue is that is that the adults the professionals find it difficult to talk about it they don't say um you know i'm really struggling at the moment um i'm really finding it tough they may they may tell their social worker but if a friend phones up and says how are you they say oh i'm fine um because actually they can't make sense of it and if you can't make sense of something it's difficult to communicate but for the child who suffered primary trauma They've lost words for feelings anyway. That's part of the brain that goes with, with primary trauma. Your capacity to put feelings into words, that's gone. It only comes back when you have that wonderful safety with that person. And then you begin to find the words. They will give you the words. They will say, you know, I really like being with you. I missed you today when you were at school. It's so good you're home. Um, and da, 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 da. And they talk about their feelings and the child begins to catch those words for feelings. Um, if the child can't recover, then they will encapsulate the trauma, by which I mean that they will carry on with their lives, but they have a, a box with a lid on inside them. And if you say the wrong thing, then that lid comes off and wow, um, watch out. For a lot of children, it's simply the word no. You say the word no to them. Um, and they first said the word no when, um, heard the word no, I beg your pardon, when they were little and they said to their mum, do you love me? And she said, no, why would I love you? So you have children who are triggered by words which are in our everyday vocabulary. We use them an awful lot except with those children, you learn not to use them. You don't say no. You say, oh, yes, um, you want to go out and play, but it's nearly dinner time. I tell you what, have dinner first and then go out and play. Because you know that if you say no, you can't go out to play, it's nearly dinner time, the child will kick off. That's what trauma does to you. 
Um, and you may also develop post-traumatic stress disorder. So this burden of trauma is what the child brings into your family. Um, and unless they're in intensive therapy, they're going to act it out in your home. And you need to understand that before we can begin to look at how that impacts upon you, because the way it impacts upon you is actually a mirroring of the way it impacts upon the child. So you understand what's going on for the child, you'll make better sense of what's going on for you. Um, because that child needs somewhere, somewhere safe to dump. And they find you. Um, and that's that's wonderful for them. Um, and it actually enables you to work therapeutically with that child, provided you recognize what's going on. Because otherwise, you just think you're failing. Otherwise, you just think you're rubbish. Um, but when that child, when you begin to feel that sense of hopelessness and helplessness, you say to the child, you know, today, when you left for school and you'd, you'd slammed out and you told me I was neffing, see you next Tuesday and da 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 da, um, I felt really useless. And then I thought, gosh, that's the feeling you've left me with. That must be a feeling you experience a lot of the time. And so in some ways I'm grateful to you because you've let me feel what you feel. And you begin to build up that connection with the child through how they've left you feeling. But you need to have that resilience and that understanding that allows you to make that equation, okay? Because otherwise you're left at the bottom of the pit. Okay. Um, this, is, this is the important bit for you, but without the first bit, this wouldn't really work that well. Um, so trauma is infectious. You catch it. You catch it from your children. Um, so you may, you may, if you're good at what you do, almost certainly have a secure attachment. That means that you are able to attune to other people. You are secure enough to come out of your comfort zone and link with that other person and say, I wonder what it's like to be you. And this is the mind-mindedness, the mentalization that, that some of you may be familiar with. It's absolutely key to therapeutic work, being able to meet that other without the defenses in place. Okay, so that's the attunement that is so necessary. So you attune to the other, and when you see what's in their internal world, you think, oh, how awful. What has that child been through? Um, and um, I put empathy plus because doing the sort of work that you're all doing, um, you have a high order of empathy. If you if you stay in this line of, of work, you have a high order of empathy, um, and that's to be celebrated. But it comes with a price tag because it means that your brain function is likely to be affected by the child's um, brain function. Um, and it doesn't happen when you're really resilient. So when you first get approved, you've had the format process, you've been to panel, you've been approved, you get your first placement, ain't going to happen. Five years down the line, six years down the line, even two years down the line, you're much more vulnerable because actually um, it's it's been a long, hard road in some ways. You know, you've had to deal with a lot of issues. You've had to use up a lot of resilience. Um, and if you're with a, a, an organisation, a local authority um, or a, um, a, a private agency who doesn't offer time out for for you um you're going to feel fairly depleted um and so you begin to mirror the child's internal world um and who catches compassion fatigue um all of you because you're empathic you're interested you're focused you wouldn't be on this training if you weren't so you're all vulnerable to compassion fatigue but equally, if you've come from a place where you're what I would call a wounded healer, so you have been through trauma yourself, your own childhood was pretty bumpy, was pretty tough. But you've come through that, you know, you had therapy or you met your partner who was um, a bit of a, a wonder worker um, and you're OK now. You, you've processed your trauma, you've moved on. 
but your brain is still wired for trauma. And the earlier your trauma happened, the easier it is for what's going on for the child to hook into your brain. Because the earliest patterns we create are the default ones. So even though you've been through um, all sorts of healing processes one way or another, if you have a child placed with you who has suffered significant trauma in their early childhood, then the chances are that you will suffer with compassion fatigue sooner than the person who has not got that background that you've got of childhood difficulties within your family. Um, and um, if it's if it's completely unresolved, you are, yes, you are very vulnerable. Um, the more traumatized the child is also, the more vulnerable you are, okay? Um, and as I said earlier, if you're caring for older people, whether they're related to you or not, um, it doesn't have the same impact at all. Okay. Um, so what happens with this, um, this process of compassion fatigue is that, you know, we have said goodbye to our last foster child. We've had two months, let us say, without a child in, in, in our family. And then a new child comes and joins us. And in that two months we've had, we've decorated the bedroom, we've got ourselves ready, we've we've made had initial visits, um, one overnight, you know, all, all good, all well. Um, or perhaps we're just ready to receive a child at very short notice. Um, when they first come, our brain's working well. They're, they're connected. Our, our thinking brain, prefrontal cortex, is getting messages from the limbic system, from the emotional brain, and managing that pretty well. Um, but if we then get to a, a place of chronic stress, this young person who's come to live with us um, is absconding a lot, is coming back with the police at one o'clock in the morning. So not getting that, I'm not getting that much sleep. Um, I've got the hassle of going down to the police station the next day because he was joyriding. You know, I've got the problem of he's too tired to go to school the next day. So I have to phone the school and da 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 da. da and he's in a bad mood. Um, and, and there's all sorts of issues. Then actually, what we do is we switch off a part of the brain called the anterior cingulate. Um, and that is emotional regulation. We switch it off because it would otherwise be working overtime to extinction to, to the point when it breaks down. So we switch off the emotional regulate. We can't, it's getting overwhelmed. Um, and, and our prefrontal cortex, the first thing that happens when we have stress is that our prefrontal cortex goes offline because that's our thinking brain. And when we're in stress, we have to respond instantly if necessary. And the example I always give, you know, if I'm crossing a road and a, a car comes at high speed around the cor corner as I'm walking across the road, um, if I engage my thinking brain and think, now is that a VW Golf or a VW Polo? You know, I'm dead meat. If I think to myself, I think he's exceeding the speed limit, I'm dead meat. What I need to do is to take my thinking brain offline, stay in my limbic system, which, which produces the adrenaline, the noradrenaline, and jump out the way. So we stick with our limbic system where the amygdala lives. Um, it's uh, The amygdala is what I call the panic button brain. I don't think anybody else calls it that, but I call it that. Um, and that's in control and it's calling the shots. Um, so we're using a lot of energy if our amygdala is in control and our judgments aren't always the best. Um, so the signs and indicators of compassion fatigue First and foremost, you have distressing emotions. You know, your social worker, if you're a foster parent, your social worker was supposed to be um, visiting today and you've just had a message to say that she's got COVID. Um, and instead of saying, or over the phone, you say, oh, I'm so sorry, but you put the phone down and you think, how could she get COVID? You know, how thoughtless, how, how totally typical, you know, that she's not going to be here. And you go into that angry, angry, tearful, 
place. Um, but you equally, with the child, um, you know, the phone goes. And you used to actually quite enjoy a phone call because it was somebody asking you to go for a coffee or something. But now the phone goes and you know it is going to be the school or somebody, a neighbour to complain um, about the noise, whatever. Um, and, you know, that phone call from the school that says um, the child is going to be excluded for two days, um, they threw a, a desk, tipped over a desk and threw a book at the teacher before leaving the premises. Um, that fear, that sense of panic, what am I going to do now? An exhaustion, not another exclusion. Um, so all sorts of distressing emotions. You also find that your own health changes. So you used to sleep quite well and now you don't. Now you're waking up typically three o'clock, two o'clock in the morning. Um, and um, you, you sometimes have nightmares. They're nearly always nightmares about being chased. They're not nightmares that come from you. They're nightmares that actually have come from the child. Um, but it's the child who's chasing you. Um, you. They might not be in the dream at all, but but that sense of, of being pursued. Um, and you're eating and drinking. You, you've always had a fairly healthy diet, but you started, let's say, um, drinking Red Bull, drinking Diet Coke, um, drinking red wine, and whatever, white wine. Um, and... and um, you're, you're eating junk food as well, a lot of chocolate, um, a lot of crisps, things that, that just feed that need to function in some shape or form. Um, and you begin to have physical illnesses, typically backache, particularly in the teaching profession. The teachers will get backache. They're carrying such burdens for these children. Um, so a PRU, an EBD, SEMH, SEND school, you'll have teachers off with backache, um, with back injuries. Um, also, um, acid gut, um, high blood pressure, um, migraine, all of those things which come from stress, which come from engaging with the child who is traumatized. You also um, go to a place that you haven't been to in the past, where physiologically you're quite aroused. So your startle response is massive. You know, that child comes in and slams the door and you nearly jump out of your skin. Um, and, and you're very hypervigilant. You're looking all the time for the, you know when that phone goes, it's going to be the school excluding him. You know when there's a knock at the door, it's going to be the next door neighbour complaining that your child has hurt their dog. Um, and you get to that place where actually you can't be doing with it and you become quite avoidant. Um, you don't wonder what's going on for the child. You don't want to enter their internal world and explore it. No, thank you very much. Um, rather, you are um, saying, go and do whatever. You know, you want to go and play with your friend who lives on the other side of the main road. OK, but be back by by five or six, you know. Um, or you go to the opposite extreme and you identify with the child and you share the child's avoidance. So you will cancel, postpone the social worker's visit. Um, you won't attend the parents' meeting, the school. What is the point? You know what you're going to hear and you don't want to be put on the spot by this teacher or that teacher, or the, so you don't attend. Um, and the carer support group, no, nope, can't do that either. Other people are doing so well with their children and you don't want to be talking about um, what's going on for you with your child. So that is a typical profile. Um, but you also have that impairment of day-to-day -day functioning um, where I've already said you miss or cancel appointments. But equally, your social workers do because they also suffer with secondary trauma. So at the point when you want that social worker to visit, they don't. Um, and at the point when they want to visit, um, when you want them to visit, sorry, when they, <laughs> they want to visit, you don't want them to visit. So yes, lots of missed and cancelled appointments. Um, 
and you don't use your support networks. You have good friends, but they don't understand. How can they understand? And particularly if those friends and relations include people who advised you not to foster, why are you, why are you fostering? You know, haven't you got enough children of your own? Isn't it time you started relaxing? You're getting near retirement age. You're suffering with empty nest syndrome. You know, don't, don't bother fostering. Um, and yet you've gone down that route. And so when things go wrong, who is there for you in that network? You need to have somebody who's there in a particular, in a particularly empathic way. Um, diminished self-organization. Um, I always remember one couple who came into the, I was director of therapy and support service in a large fostering organization. Um, and this family came over to us from um, the local authority and they had five, a sibling group of five placed with them and two birth children. So seven children under 16, um, a large house. So they had the accommodation, but I went to visit them when they first joined us. And I was, they were just so spent. Um, and and the, the guy who was very fastidious, I found out, but he said to me, we are so busy with these children. He said, I haven't had time to shower um, for three weeks you know and I resisted the urge to push push my chair back um, but as I found out later very fastidious hygiene of a very high order but when suffering with secondary trauma with suffering with compassion fatigue um, nothing left to give to yourself or to the child so that compassion fatigue is not only with the child it's also with yourself, you have no love left for yourself either. Why bother? Um, so um, a sense of isolation, of course, because nobody knows what you're going through. Nobody understands. You're not communicating with them anyway. Um, and nobody appreciates just how difficult it is with this child or these children. So you go into that place of hyper arousal dissociation. So you either go, if you remember from the earlier slide, a place where you're hyperized, you're super active, or you're going to that place of dissociation where you just shut down. And if there's two of you, if there's, you know, um, two wives, two husbands, husband and wife, whatever, partners, one of you often goes in one direction, the other one goes the other. So in our family, we, we suffered, we both suffered um, set, uh, compassion fatigue once um, quite badly with um, a, a couple of brothers who'd been... Um, who joined our family and um, I was in hyper arousal mode so I would pick up the boys from school and we'd go swimming and then we'd call in and do some shopping on the way home might, might visit a friend get home eat then it would be bath time because they were younger children they were six and seven when they joined us then it would be bath time bedtime private talk time PTT time and then they would collapse into bed exhausted and I would be pretty exhausted too but I was in that hyper arousal, got to keep going mode. Um, no time for thinking, no time for reflection. My husband, um, when the boys came home and if they were on one, he would occasionally say, I'm just going to, to tidy the workshop. His workshop was at the bottom of the garden and he would disappear, sometimes with um, a bottle of red wine down to his workshop. Um, and there he stayed until the boys went to bed. Um, I think he had the, the most sensible outlook in some ways, but that's typical. You have one partner going in one direction, another partner going in another direction. So your performance, um, your performance is affected quite profoundly. So, your the quality and the quantity of what you produce of what you do is affected you make more mistakes um because to concentrate that means you disconnect from the trauma um you disconnect from um what's going on for that child and going on for you um and you don't care you know that compassion fatigue means that you don't care in the same way. Think about the blocked care, which is the synonymous in, in lots of ways with compassion fatigue. Um, so you're just going through the motions. You haven't got the energy to do other than go through the motions. Um, 
And sometimes you get quite angry about it anyway. You know, why don't they give more support? Why? How do they expect you to get your logs in by Monday morning after the weekend that you've had? You know, um, so angry um, and not caring. So more mistakes. And you avoid certain tasks. I would certainly avoid writing my logs. So they had to be in on a Monday morning. And on Sunday evening, I had two tasks to iron the school uniforms and do any other ironing and to do my logs. Um, and I did the ironing first and I would do the logs. And I, when I found myself not only ironing the school uniforms, but then starting to iron pants and socks, I knew that I was in compassion fatigue because actually I didn't want to engage with the trauma. I didn't want to engage with my failures. I didn't want to engage with um, putting all of that information about the child, the tri child's traumatic acting out. I didn't want to put that down in a record. It was too painful to do it. Um, and it just reawakened the trauma in me. It, it just re-sparked it. So I would do anything rather than do those logs. They still got done, but often very late. And they were bullet points rather than connected paragraphs. Um, and you either become perfectionist, which is the hyper-aroused person, or you become irresponsible, which is the dissociated person. So, you know, I can remember the children stopping one of our children going out the door saying, you can't go to school in that shirt. It's got dirt on the cuffs. It's got ink. You've got to go and get it changed. And he said, I'm going to be late. And, and instead of picking my battles, which I, I, I'm fairly careful about doing um, with, with our children, um, I would hang on to it. You know, that perfectionism became obsessive. You have to go and change that shirt. I'm not letting you go to school dressed like that. Um, so your judgment is flawed um, and you make poor judgments. And this exhausts you because you end up having a major battle as this child is going out the door. Um, and as I said before, you can become irresponsible. Yes, of course, you can go to school um, wearing your, your hoodie. Um, it's unreasonable to, for them to expect you not to wear it when you've lost your blazer, you know, um, a little bit irresponsible. OK, um, as far as morale is concerned, you find that children um, have all of those um, features in their trauma. But equally, you find that the professionals who are engaging with those children who are suffering with compassion fatigue um, suffer in the same way. So they lose confidence. Um, they don't think they can manage this child. This child is beyond their skill set. Um, and um, what more can they do? There's a sort of apathy. I, you know, I've done everything I can. What more can I do? There's no point. There is no point. We're never going to get a campus appointment. OK, the six months, by the time six months down the line, you know, Armageddon could have happened. So um, there's no point. CAMS isn't going to be helping us. Um, his, we're on our third social worker. Um, well, since this child came to us, you know, 10 months ago, he's had three social workers um, and we're on our second social worker. So what is the point? There's an apathy that gets generated and a general dissatisfaction, you know. Um, it comes almost with a sort of if-only mindset. If only CAMS would do their job. If only social services would do their job. If only the birth family didn't insist on contact and the court approved contact, if only. So there's that dissatisfaction. There's a dissat dissatisfaction with oneself. It comes from that. You know, I'm not doing a good enough job. But it is... Um, manifest in other ways as well typically with the network around you that negativity nothing's going to work we tried everything we have absolutely tried everything with this child you know he's he's been to cubs and scouts she has joined the you know the cheerleaders group <clears throat> she um is um not able to connect with friends so I'm not going to invite any more anybody else home she just um she's so possessive about her friendship she 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 sort of suffocates any friendship that she has there's no point so 
dissatisfaction, negativity, despairing, all of that. But it's also despairing about yourself. You know, I can't talk about this with my friends. They wouldn't understand. Um, they think I'm I'm mad anyway. Um, and, you know, uh, my partner said they were really keen when we started fostering, but now they've gone back to work full-time. They were only working part-time before they've gone back to work full-time, leaving me um, with a sibling group of three. How am I supposed to manage, you know? And all the time, subsuming your own needs under the children. So therefore, the children absolutely come first. So you will save up enough money for them to have a PGL holiday or whatever, but and social services will support with that for sure. Children's services will will give you some activity money, some holiday money, whatever. Um, but then you haven't got enough money for you to go abroad. And is there any point? It's so much hassle going having a holiday. Um, but your own needs are always subsumed under the children. They're less important than the child's. And quite often we find that children's services, social workers, um, leaders of all sorts will encourage that. They will encourage that. The child is the most important person. Um, and, and I have to disagree because actually, if we don't look after ourselves, if we don't look after the social worker, the foster parent, the adoptive parent, then the child is going to lose out. We have to look after you. Um, because if all of that is going on, then you're going to withdraw. You know, you're going to withdraw inside a shell, put the shutters up and say, I will um, I will continue to do the best I can with the very limited resources that I have, knowing that I'm bound to fail. But I think you should probably re um, remove the child. It is that sort of scenario we could end up with. Um, so the whole network, and by the whole network, I'm talking about children's services, I'm talking about CAMs, I'm talking about schools, um, I'm talking about the foster family, the adoptive family. Um, everybody begins to withdraw. Everybody um, begins to um, show a lack of appreciation for each other. They're impatient. There's an increase in conflict. There's very poor communication. You know, why doesn't the foster parent phone social worker and let them know they're taking this child out of school for two days? And is that OK? Why don't they have that communication system where all it is is an email, all it is is a phone call? Well, it's because actually they're both suffering with compassion fatigue. And you end up also with this trauma triangle where instead of having dyadic relationships, which are you and me, two of us, we have a, a trauma triangular relationship where we have a persecutor, a victim, a rescuer. When that child first comes to you, the child is the victim the birth family or the previous foster carer, let us imagine, is the persecutor, and you are the rescuer. That child, five months down the line, sometimes five days down the line, um, you are the victim, the child is the persecutor, and if only the social worker would visit, they could rescue you. So that triangular dy dynamic is typical of compassion fatigue. So, Begin by recognizing that this is an occupational hazard. This is what happens. Only if you're empathic, only if you're good at what you do. You have to be good at it to suffer this stuff because empathy and that safety that you offer children by being a container for whatever it is that they throw at you is a prerequisite for suffering from compassion fatigue. Um, name your own feelings and your experiences. And, and you know, I've talked for only a short time, but has it made sense? Does it reflect your own truth? If it does, then you say, okay, I have to look after myself better. I need to care about myself more because that is the antidote. That is the, the medicine for compassion fatigue. Um, so you're going to enlist the support of an empathic other person, someone who isn't judgmental. Um, and once they've engaged with you in offering that empathic understanding, then you can begin to get in touch with the feelings that you haven't been in touch with before. Um, and once that, and that, that, that empathic other is usually a more, um, a more experienced, 
a foster parent than you, a more experienced social worker than you, somebody who, who has been through what you've been through, probably, um, and who has the same sort of understanding and language of trauma and children. Um, once you've got that engagement with that other person, your prefrontal cortex, your higher brain, the cortical brain, gets back in control. And you can begin that proactive engagement with your child. You can begin to say, hang on a minute, you know, um, let's just sit down and talk about this. Before you go off, let's just sit down and talk. And you begin to engage again. And you begin to give them the message that they still matter. And that means the boundaries are still there. And the boundaries are actually as firm as they ever were. They just momentarily were um, blurred. And um, you need to practice assertiveness. Don't don't apologize to um, don't apologize to people. The, the school, you know, when the school say um, we're going to do an internal exclusion, he'll be in a room by himself. She will be she will be in a room by herself with with a teacher at the back of the room, and she will have to get on with her work. Um, and what was her offence? Oh, she, you know, she gave the, the teacher, the TA, the Elsa, whatever it was, a mouthful of verbals. Or she came in with um, artificial eyelashes and long red nails. She didn't leave home with them, but by the time she got to school, she had them. And that's against school dress code. Um, you stand up for that child. You advocate for that child and say, actually, the trauma they've been through means that that internal exclusion where they're on their own with somebody sitting behind them um, is going to re-traumatise, is not going to be helpful. Can I come and talk to you about it? So you'll begin to engage and you won't apologise for the strategies that you've put in place, the boundaries that you've put in place for that particular... You've learnt your child. You know what's right for your child. You stick to that and you get the... Um, the professional support you need and if you're if you're a good person to stand up in front of a crowd and talk then you go and teach the school about compassion fatigue you go and talk to other people the youth club the scouts the scout master or whatever about compassion fatigue um and for me what i found and this is personal obviously but i found that the more research the more reading i did the more confident I became about what I was talking about, the more I could say, this is true. It's true for me and it may well be true for you. Knowledge is empowering. Knowledge gives us confidence. Okay. So go for it. Um, and then training. Um, if you're going to prevent it, if you're going to prevent it, then you need to understand. You need to have stress management in place. How do you manage your stress? What do you do to help you manage stress? Do you make a cup of tea? Do you take the dog for a walk? Do you have a very long shower in the mornings or in the evenings? You know, um, you know, how do you actually manage it? I don't find pinning rubber bands on my wrist helps, but I do find that walking the dog helps. I do find that that um, physical exercise of any sort helps me manage stress, um, but also. Professional development. I mean, the only reason I trained as a psychotherapist, the child psychotherapist initially, was because I wasn't allowed in the meetings where professionals were talking about my children. And it really made me cross. So I trained. Um, so get some training. Personal development. Sarah, you've come on my screen again. Are you telling me that actually I've got to stop? Oh, lovely, Liza. I'm not, actually. I'm going to let you continue Wonderful. for another couple of minutes and then I'm just going lovely. to... Okay, together. that's so brilliant. You okay, crack on. In, carry on. In, fact, in terms of your support, um, you build up informal support among people that you know and whose practice as a foster parent you know is good, um, and other people, you know, the teachers of your children that seem empathic, that phone you up and give you updates. Um, let them support you sometimes as well. But always get that challenger in place. Somebody who understands about compassion fatigue because you've talked to them about it or they've experienced it themselves and come through it themselves and know about it. Um, but you need to have, because you don't necessarily recognize it for yourself. You know, it needs somebody to say, hang on a minute. You know, for, my, for, for myself, the reason I became aware of it 
was because my daughter said to me, you're not much fun to be with anymore, mum. That was my birth daughter. You're not much fun to be with anymore. That alerted me to the fact that actually I was a bit getting overwhelmed by the stress that the children were generating, our, our foster children were generating. Um, and, and actually, I was short on compassion. Um, also go for formal support, you know, whether it's foster care clinics, whether it's individual therapy. Look after yourself in any way that you can. Really important. Um, so individual therapy with a trauma specialist, if you can afford that, if your organisation offers that, but also environmental in interventions. You know, what what works for you? Is it lavender oil in the bath? Is it um, just that lovely sense of, of warmth around you in this cold weather, putting that, that oody on in the cold weather in front of the fire when you've come in from outside? Um, does that soothe you? Does that calm you? Or do you need stimulating because you're dissociated? Do you need to um, go to the gym um, and do something there? Look at alternative therapies as well. Massage reflexology, I imagine you're, you're familiar with. Havening, you might not be familiar with. I haven't got time to talk about it, but if you go um, onto YouTube and type it in, Havening, it's something you administer to and it works. It absolutely works. I do it a lot with groups, but I also use it for myself. Um, so self-care. Take time out to recharge and renew. Um, and finally, I think reconnect. Once you've recharged yourself, recognize that you've forgiven yourself and actually you can forgive the child. Um, but it always has to be you reconnecting. Don't expect them to reconnect with you. They can't do it. They really can't do it. Okay. And I finished. How about that? That How was, that? do you know what? Bang on. I'm very impressed. Yes. Liza, thank you. I'm just looking through. I haven't, I don't think I'm just having a very brief look. There are any specific, ah, oh, there is a very specific point here made by one of our lovely guests saying uh, this has really resonated uh, they have two young people males recently who've left them very high needs trauma inflicted since they've left uh, this particular person's been dogged by illness and fatigue they're a single carer and the whole load was on them they've uh, during the placement they maintain that oh the gym the gym routine and healthy eating lifestyle style went out the window um, and so I guess that just sort of reinforces your your recent point of of that need liza yes. do you agree yeah absolutely absolutely uh, yes. there's been just just one more sorry to keep you all there's just been one more comment by uh one of uh the lovely people who've joined us today just to say the webinar has been so wonderful liza gets it with an explanation mark it feels great to feel understood and accepted fostering is challenging on so many levels and so we badly need to hear that what we're going through is normal and the way our child transfers to the mum usually is not taught enough. Thank you so much. This will help our whole family. So how wonderful is that? That's, that's really my pleasure. Really yeah. great. Yeah. And lots of thank yous coming through. So um, yeah, that's wonderful. Um, just to say to you all, those that have asked uh, for slides and things, unfortunately we aren't able to share the slides. Um, if you would like to experience this training on a slightly more comprehensive level, please get in contact with us. Uh, we'd be really delighted to provide your organization with maybe a face-to-face -face event with Liza herself or, or a, a webinar um, or any information that you need around additional training that we could support you or your organization with. We'd be so thrilled to hear from you. Um, but Liza, thank you. It Thank it you. was an exceptional session as always. Thank you so for so many of you for joining us. We've, it's been wonderful to have you all with us. Um, and I really do hope that you were able to benefit from Liza's wisdom and experience this morning. So thank you very much all. Thank you. Bye-bye.